And it felt like the scriptures had sent me these people, these heroes to carry me through this really, really hard time. You know, taking care of him and that time was completely and utterly overwhelming and the greatest privilege of my life. And I wish I were doing it now. They learn how to think about others. They learn how to see others through the eyes of the Savior. Hello and welcome to Latter-day Profiles. I'm Brian Howard. We're here at the LDS Motion Picture Studio in Provo, Utah. And joining me today is Tammy Uzelak Hall. Tammy, welcome. Hi, thank you. So, so good to have you. People recognize your voice, at least, from the Sunday on Monday podcast. Some people do. Uh, yes, <laughs> and you've also been a seminary and institute teacher as well. Yep. Uh, you are a, a wanted speaker at many of the women's conferences and things like that. So kind it's good to have you here. And people can do a Google and see some of the videos that you've done. You have some fun stories to tell. So it's so, so good to have you here. Uh, as I was doing some research on, you grew up in Utah, and as you're growing up, uh, what were your career plans? What do you think you're going to be? I think you talked about being a nurse or something like oh, that. Oh, gosh. I mean, originally when I was a, you know 12 years old in what they called beehives, uh, I was going to just grow up, get married, raise my 12 kids while I put my husband through medical school. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my life plan. <laughs> I wasn't going to go to school. And I laughed because my dad, my senior year, he came to me and he said, all right, where are you going to college? And I looked at him and I said, Dad, I'm not. I'm getting married and I'm going to have kids. <laughs> and he, in his kind heart, looked at me and said, you don't have a boyfriend and you've never had a boyfriend. You didn't go to prom. So I just, I don't know. Oh, all right, whatever. So at the time, he handed me a Rick's College application and I just fill it out. And I'm like, whatever. And that's what happened. I went to Rick's. I went to BYU. I served a mission. I came back and was a social worker for a couple of years. And then I had a very inspired bishop tell me I should be a seminary and institute teacher, which I was like, I didn't even like seminary when I was in it because my family <laughs> moved from Utah to Missouri. So we did, we did early oh, morning early seminary. Morning. Oh, yeah. So I don't know, just a really cool spiritual experience that led me to take the classes. And I ended up becoming a seminary teacher, got my master's degree and just taught seminary and institute mm. for a long time. Yeah, did did you enjoy it? You know, as I was listening to you, so the first, it wasn't a love at first sight kind of thing, but you learned to really love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and especially because it was a major career change. Mm. I never in a million years thought that that's where God would take me. And so I remember my first couple of months teaching seminary, it was really hard because I had just taken the place of the most beloved <laughs> seminary teacher ever, Michelle Boyack, that was her name at the time. And I, I joke with her, she was the Julie Andrews of seminary teachers. She could even play the guitar and sing. <laughs> and so I came in and took her place and the kids just weren't having it. And it was a hard sell. And I remember I went to one of the seminary teachers that I worked with and I said, you know, these kids don't like me. And I I don't know what's going on. And he, he is just this very beautiful, calm, quiet man. And he looks at me and he, he leaves my office, comes back with his scriptures, and he opens up to Moroni. And I was kind of rolling my eyes. I'm like, listen, don't go scripture on me, mister. I must, just tell me what to do. And he read from Moroni chapter 7 about charity. Hmm. And he said, he read the chapter that says, charity never faileth. And he looked at me and he goes, I think you just need more charity. And I was so offended because I said, <laughs> I'm a former social worker. I have charity. I love the homeless. They're my people. Like, don't tell me I need to be more charitable. And I gave all the reasons why I didn't need to have more charity. And he looked at me and he looked back at the scripture and looked up and said, well, it says it doesn't fail. So <laughs> I don't have to tell you. And so I, at that moment, I was going to prove him and the Lord wrong that charity indeed would fail. And so I loved the heck out of those kids. I went to every, <laughs> oh, and, and at this high school I taught at, they were the, the last place in everything. I went to every losing game, every concert, every show, everything they did to prove to those kids, they're not going to like me. And gosh, you know what? Charity never faileth. Because <laughs> by the end of that school year, when I got transferred, tears. Those kids were mm. sobbing. They didn't want me to leave. I didn't want to leave. It was the most beautiful experience. Yeah, that's fun. And so I did. I got transferred and I've just taught at a bunch of different schools and I taught institute level too. And it really became a labor of love. I just loved teaching seminary and I love the scriptures, mm. like love the scriptures in a weird way. Mm. I didn't ever think I would, but it's, yeah, it's, they're the greatest. Mm. Now, as I was listening to some of the things you've done before, you shared a story I thought was intriguing, especially in the light uh, right now. So many people struggle or something that comes up and they struggle with their testimonies. Like, oh, I didn't know that. And you shared a story about uh, a book that you read about the you know, history of Joseph Smith that oh, yeah. threw a wrench in the work. It was like, oh my gosh. So tell me about that. Oh, it was devastating. So as a new seminary teacher, 
I mean, I always joke that when I became, when I went on my mission, I didn't even know how Christ had come to America. <laughs> I read Third <laughs> Nephi 11, and I looked at my companions and I said, you guys, did you know Christ came to America? And they looked up at me. I was in a, three, a, a trio, and they looked at me and they're like, are you a convert? <laughs> no, I'm not. I just, there, there's no song about Christ coming to America in primary, so I didn't know it. And so I, I, there were so many things that I needed to learn and the things I didn't know. And I can remember we got to church history year, and one of the teachers that I taught with, he came to me, he recommended I read the specific church history book. Now, this is a long time ago, and many people try to guess which one it is. You won't guess it. It's an old yeah, church history yeah. book. And he said, you should read this. And I was like, all right, what do I know? And I read it, and as I turned every page, I started to find out about Joseph Smith, things I had never known, mm -hmm. things that hadn't been taught to me that were true, that didn't sit well with me because I just didn't know about it. It made me uncomfortable. And I finished reading that book, and it took me a couple of weeks. And by the time I was done, I was convinced that this church was not true, that there's no way that any of it could be. He is a fraud. It is ridiculous. And I was mad. I was so angry that this teacher recommended that I read this book because at this point I had decided I'm done. I have to quit. And now I got to find a new job and a way to make pay my bills. I mean, I had already gone down that rabbit hole. And so I went back into this teacher's office at the end of the, the three weeks it took me to read the book. And I just threw it on his desk. And I said, uh, and I started sobbing and I said, I have to quit my job. Hmm. And I couldn't stop crying. And almost in like this dramatic fashion, I leaned against the wall and just slid down it. <laughs> There's so much drama. And I slid down it into this like fetal position with my knees up and I was just sobbing. And I said, it's over. Like the church isn't true. And I can't believe that I believed in this lie all this long and I'm embarrassed. And, and he let me cry it out. And then I got done and he looked at me and he said, let me ask you this. And, you know, I look up, just mascara running, and and he said, what did you believe was true before you read the book? And I was like, what are you talking about? And he says, well, what did you always know was true? And I started listing things. I said, well, I believed that God and Jesus Christ love me. I believed that families could be together forever. I believe that the Savior is my my Redeemer and that the atonement is real. And I just started listing off all the things that I always believed. And he looked at me and he said, if you believed it was true before the book, still true. None of that has changed. Just because you read something that made you uncomfortable and that you weren't sure about doesn't have an effect on what is true. Truth is truth. And he just kind of talked me through that whole situation. And he said, you have to find this out for yourself. This is important. That's why I had you read the book. And I, oh, I was so mad at him because I was really <laughs> happy just not knowing. And um, he said, you're going to have to work this out. And figure it out. And, um, and I, he's like, you don't need to quit. You're being so dramatic. And so I remember I spent every day praying that I would know if Joseph Smith was a prophet. And what was interesting is that I had said that exact same prayer on my mission mm -hmm. because I had been challenged if Joseph Smith was a prophet. And I'd never prayed about that before. And I remember praying on my mission, is Joseph Smith a prophet, thinking I would totally have a Joseph Smith experience. And I didn't. I woke up the next morning feeling the same way I did that night when I prayed. Mm -hmm. And I just put my skirt on and got to work. And I, that was 10 years. And now here I am, 31 years old, saying the same prayer. And it took, it took months until finally I was teaching the kids from Joseph Smith history, the story where Joseph Smith says, I knew it and I knew God knew it and I could not deny it. And it just, from my head to my toes, I knew it and I knew God knew it and I could not deny it. And none of that stuff mattered. Like it, it found a place. All of that uncomfortableness found a, a safe space where I think it's okay not to know. And, and that is what faith is all about. But I knew Joseph Smith was a prophet of God at that very moment. I just knew it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that was a reminder. I think we all go through those moments in our religious experience yeah. where we question things and we're uncomfortable. And one of the things I love about the podcast that I host I have friends that join me each week, two different friends, and we laugh and we are, it is so much fun, but we talk about the doctrine and we talk about the come follow me lesson for the week. And I'll tell you what something means in Hebrew and why that's important. But one of my guests is Tamu Smith, and she's mm -hmm. part of the Sisters in Zion yeah. um, combo. And she and Xander have a really great saying that I love, which is, it's okay to be comfortable. Uh, sorry, they say, it's okay to be uncomfortable because then the spirit can do its job and let it comfort. And that space of being uncomfortable between being comforted is where faith comes in. Mm. And that is the key to our religion. And I think we're losing faith because we live in, there's just this society where you can get answers quick and you yeah. can order things online fast and immediate gratification. 
that faith has kind of lost its space. Mm. You gotta fight for it. Don't Honestly. Just, just don't order and have a delivered DoorDash at the yeah. door. Yeah, it's okay to have unanswered <laughs> questions. Yeah, that's right. It's okay to be uncomfortable, like lean into that uncomfort and then let the Holy Ghost do its job. Mm. You know, as uh, again, listening to some of the things you talked about, uh, one of the things you joke about is uh, not be married, you know, early in life. And I guess you relate somewhat to that. You know, I was on 28, so I guess that's not Oh, you were an old man. I was an old man. 28. Yeah, I was a minister to society for many years. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But, you know, tell me about that, because that, you know, a struggle for a lot of people. It's something you want, something you dream about, but yet it's just not happening. And so you kind of just went about your business, you know, I'm just going to do my thing. Uh, You know, and then you did need someone to marry. I know. Talk about about leaning into like, <laughs> uncertainty. I mean, I was, yeah, I was 35 when I got married and that was not part of my plan. And that was, that was hard too. There were definitely days where I just thought the Lord has forsaken me. He hasn't heard my prayers. I mean, my prayer from the age of, I would say 25 to 35 was the same every night. Help me to get married and have kids. That's exactly what I prayed. And God, he was good on that word because <laughs> I got married and had kids in the same day. I married a widower. And that just, it turned out better than I could have ever imagined. Mm. Honestly, he had two little girls at the time. They were seven and nine. Mm. And I became insta mom. I joked that I was a bride for four days. That's how long our honeymoon lasted. And then I came home and became a mom. Came home and became a mom instantly. Oh, what a challenge. (laughs) It's so hard, Brian, because honestly, when I was single, I was like the best mom in the world. I'd see kids in the grocery store acting up and I'd think to that mom, oh, she just needs love and logic, you know, consequences and choices. Yeah, that does not work. So, and I became a mom and wow, it's the hardest thing in the world. It's amazing how our expertise falls away as soon as we get placed in the situation. Like, oh, you know, it wasn't so easy, right? It's so true. Uh, I love the story, uh, especially probably the best uh, fast and testimony meeting ever that you attended where I actually got introduced to your husband. That's true. That is how I met him. Can I tell that story? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. It's such a good story. So I had just bought a house. I'm done. Like, I'm not getting married. I have just agreed that maybe it's not in the cards. We always say, whether in this life or in the next, you know, (laughs) patriarchal blessing caveat. And I had just figured it's over. I'm not getting married. And I bought a home. My sister got divorced with two children. She came and lived with me. And I just thought, I'm just going to take care of my family, be a seminary institute teacher. So basically an LDS nun is (laughs) what I would have been. And I went to this family ward and a woman got up to bear her testimony who I had not met before. And she ran to the podium and I thought, oh boy, this will be a doozy. And she stands up and she grabs the sides of the podium and she says, she lets out a big sigh. And then she says, I don't know why I'm up here. I'm really mad at God. I have no idea what I'm going to say. I mean, I haven't prayed in forever. And I am like, this is so awesome. Who starts a testimony like this? And then she starts to talk about how she had spent the last four years watching her sister die of breast cancer Mm. and leave behind two little girls. And she couldn't understand why and that it wasn't fair. And she had, and in my mind, I'm like, you have a right to be mad at God. Absolutely. And then I'm in the audience crying and the whole, we're all, I mean, the spirit's so strong and this, this sweet woman bearing her testimony about that. And right at that moment, this thought came into my mind that said, you're going to go out with that dead woman's husband. And I know that sounds callous, but that's Mm. really how I heard it. And then I laughed because Seriously, it could have been someone who's 70 years old, and I would have thought, oh, we'll probably get set up because I had dated the free world. Brian, you probably know someone I went out with. I'm surprised we didn't date. I mean, I dated every single guy. I once flew to, like, North the No, where did I? Oh, I flew to um, Santa Fe for a date. Oh, like, New I Mexico. dated New Mexico. I dated everybody. So I got out of sacrament meeting, and I walked into Sunday school where I would be the teacher. I was teaching gospel doctrine, and she's on the back row. And I went up and introduced myself to her, and I said, hi, I'm Tammy. I know we've never met. Thank you for your real and candid testimony. And she grabs my hand and says, I want you to go out with my dead sister's husband. (laughs) And I was just like, who has a pen and paper? Let's write this down. And I wrote my name and number down so fast. And he called me that Thursday and we went out and then we got married nine months later. Wow. And it's interesting because he was in therapy after his wife had passed away. And the therapist said, you know, most men in your situation, they'll marry about nine months to a year after their wife passes away. And he said, no, I'm never getting remarried. Mm. Now here we are 15 years later. I cannot believe 
I can't even believe it. I love being married. Like being a mom, super hard. But for me being married, it's just a dream. Yeah. Well, I know it's interesting. You, know, you became instant mom, but then you had two kids together. And yeah. so you also went through kids that were seven and nine at the time, right? And then the babies. So you got the whole full, whole, full experience yeah. and uh, challenging. Now, how old are the seven and nine-year-olds now? Oh, my gosh. Now they're 25 and 23. Oh, wow. And then 15 and 13 15 are the and other 13. two. Isn't oh. that crazy? Yeah, yeah. I know. I Time can't flies. even believe it. And they're just... Right now, we're just a good space. Like, they are just delightful human beings. I love them so much. But it was not always that way. I mean, that <laughs> that nine-year-old who's now 25, and, it, and she will – I have permission to tell this story from her. I mean, she was just so angry because no nine-year-old should have to bury their mom. Yeah. And uh, really angry for many, many years. Did not like me. I did not like her. It was rough. In fact, I can remember one time – I had to put her in timeout and she was walking down the hallway screaming, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. <laughs> and we learned in therapy that you are not supposed to meet emotion with emotion, which that cost me a $20 copay for you, it's free. <laughs> You're not supposed to meet emotion with emotion. And so she's yelling at me, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. And I'm just standing there holding my tongue and folding my arms. And I'm like, I know, you know, answering so softly. She gets to the door, she yells, I hate you. And she goes to close it and opens it back up and yells, and I always will, and slams it <laughs> shut. And I just think back to that moment because she grew up, she ended up serving a mission, which just changed her heart. I mean, that is the atonement in action, is mm. my sweet Anna. And I and she is the happiest human being right now. And um, I just love her. But it's just funny because when she was nine, if someone had said, you know, she's going to serve a mission, I would have been like, <laughs> God will never use someone this angry. But he does. Thank goodness. So, uh, thank goodness. yeah, she is just awesome. And um, all of them. I love all my girls. They they are siblings. Mm. They fight. They love all of that. Well, I want to talk to you about your podcast, your book, and your love of Hebrew. And so first, uh, let's talk about your book. So you got interested in Hebrew, and it's a big part of your book. Yeah. And give me the official title uh, about rubies, right? The worth of a woman. Give mm -hmm. me the official title. It's called Far Above Rubies, The Power and Promise of a Covenant-Keeping Woman. And before anyone rolls their eyes, <laughs> I just have to say, we take the proverb of a virtuous woman, which is found in Proverbs chapter 31, verses 10 through 31, and we totally flip it on its head. Yeah. Like it has nothing to do with sewing and cooking and cleaning or any of that. <laughs> it is solely about a covenant woman relationship with Christ and all women are doing it. Yeah. And now everyone's clapping. Oh, yay. Know, and by the way, yeah. sold out. I tried to get a copy. It's sold out everywhere. So that's uh, obviously people are getting the message, which is fantastic. So. so pre order if you haven't got one yet. <laughs> Amazon always has it. Yeah. Seagull, I think. Mean. Uh, but you you took that, you know, talking about, uh, you know, a virtuous woman. And I love that. And part of that was, is that you're talking about, you know, covenant keeping. Mm -hmm. And it kind of, speaking of, you know, nuns, you know, that's part of, the, I guess, Catholicism, right? Married to Christ. But actually, that is symbolically that, that he's he's the bridegroom and we are. Are, you know, he's married to him. How did how did you come into deciding I'm going to write a book about this? Oh, I mean, that's what's so funny about this because I am not a writer. I'm not an author. I don't. I always joke that the last book I read was Super Fudge. Do you remember Super Fudge? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I do. I always joke that was the last book I read just because I'm not like it's crazy that I'm at this point where I I can say I wrote a book, but truly Heavenly Father was awesome, divinely guided every word. I just decided to do it because when I finally, well, when I was teaching seminary and institute, when I would come to the proverb, and as anyone who knows who teaches Proverbs 31, you just kind of wing it. There's nothing written about this proverb, nothing. Not mm -hmm. one religious scholar has said, here's what these verses mean. Every lesson for this specific verse of scripture just says qualities to look for in a future spouse mm. or qualities to look for in a wife. And so I remember just making stuff up. Like we get to a <laughs> verse and I'd say, well, this probably means she's a really good cook. And this probably means she, like, verse 21 is the one that kills me. She's not afraid of the snow for her household for all her household is clothed in scarlet. And I remember a kid saying, so if you can't be afraid of the snow and be virtuous. And I was like, apparently not, that doesn't make sense. So the first qualifier in the proverb is you have to be married. Mm -hmm. Her husband does safely trust in her. And I can remember saying to my students, someday I'll be virtuous. When I get married, I'll come back to this verse. And so I got married, came back to the proverb and started reading it. And I remember the first question I asked was, do you really have to be married, Heavenly Father? Like this camp, and I remember I was sitting in my bedroom, um, my two older girls were at school and I just had baby Lily and she was in her bed taking a nap in her crib. And I was sitting against the wall reading the proverb thinking, I'm going to study it now. 
And that's the first, like verse 10 is who can find a virtuous woman. But then verse 11 is her husband does safely trust in her. And I did say, does she really have to be married? Because there's so many great women out there who are single. And I sat there and waited for an answer. And the spirit was so strong. And it said, the husband's Christ. Mm -hmm. You've always known that. We believe that throughout the whole Old Testament. And that's what began my journey as I thought, I've got to find out what this proverb is about. And so I ended up taking Hebrew class. And I've been studying Hebrew for seven years. And I will study it for the rest of my life. There is never going to be an end spot for me because mm -hmm. it is so intense. But I read it in Hebrew. And I found out that it is an allegory and that these 22 verses of scripture really actually mean the husband's Christ and every verse is how covenant keeping women are enough. Mm -hmm. And you don't even have to be perfect at it. You just have to be trying, which yeah. is so cool. Yeah, which is so cool. Yeah. And by the way, snow ends up being death. Oh, She's not afraid of spiritual death or physical death. And it says for her household, which is such a cool word. It actually means anyone who falls under her umbrella of influence. So you don't have to have kids. And then it says for her household is clothed in scarlet. And scarlet is a symbol of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So... Of course, we're not afraid yeah. of physical or spiritual death. We uh, get it. Yeah. So that's makes what that makes so is. much more sense. So right? I don't have to bury my fear of snow anymore. <laughs> <laughs> totally. And virtuous isn't modesty or chastity. In Hebrew and in Latin and in Greek, it is power or strength. When the Savior is in the story about the Savior and the woman with an issue of blood, she touches the hem of her garment and he says, "I felt virtue go out of me." Mm. Like he didn't say, "I felt modesty leave me or chastity leave me." He said virtue, and that means power or strength, oh, his power. Interesting. So we are filled with his power when we enter covenants. Mm. So interesting to get those insights uh, with know, the Hebrew, right? especially with the Old Testament, I'm sure. I mean, it. okay, can we just do a verse of scripture? Yeah, Is absolutely. that okay? Put one out. Okay, because okay, this is my favorite thing well right worn, now. Well worn, by the way. I'm very impressed. Very well worn. Oh, my gosh. I know I bought a new set of scriptures for the podcast, and it's a journal size, and it is like this big. <laughs> like, what was I thinking? Okay, this is my favorite. You will love this. Okay, okay so this year we're doing, ex we're doing the Old Testament, and we just got done studying Exodus, where Moses brings the children of Israel across, and they're about to part the Red Sea. But before they part the Red Sea, Pharaoh finally says to Moses, get out of here, just go. Like, take your people, I'm done. And so Moses is leaving with all of the children of Israel, and I love in Exodus 14, verse 8, it says... Uh, this verse, the children of Israel went out with a high hand. And in Hebrew, the translation for that is they went out triumphantly, like, mm. oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. we got it. You know, they're so excited. And I'm just imagining me going, yeah. And then I turn around and I see Pharaoh and all of his chariots coming down the hill. And I'm like, ah, you know, like, shoot. And so you turn the page. And the children of Israel are freaking out because what's going on is they're now they're starting to piece things together. And I wonder if they're like, wait a minute. Moses and Pharaoh, they knew each other. Maybe this was a setup the whole time, and they're just going to kill us all right here, every last one of us. So they turn to Moses and they say, it would have been better if we just stayed in Egypt. I can't believe you dra drag us out here, and they're so sad. And then what's so cool is, now touch the base of your neck. This is kind of fun. Okay. Touch the base of your neck and see that bone at the very base. Mm -hmm. Then there's a soft spot. Okay. okay, if you push your finger all the way through that soft spot, you're going to hit what's called the amygdala. Yeah. And the amygdala in your brain is what God gave every single one of us that is our flight or fight response. Mm -hmm. So the minute you are in a situation where you know you need to run and you should be afraid, that kicks in and it helps you get out of situations that are scary. So here's the children of Israel and their amygdala has kicked <laughs> in because they're seeing the chariots come down the hill and then they are, have water on the other side. Yeah. They don't know what to do. And for me, I would be screaming, run or swim. Like, we got to get out of here. And it's so fascinating that in Exodus chapter 14, verse 13, this is what Moses and the Lord says. Moses said unto the people, fear ye not and stand still. It's not interesting that he, mm. they're telling him, do the very opposite of what your body's telling you to do. And so the children of Israel are probably thinking, you are crazy. So he says, fear not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. Not next week, not, not when it's good and for him, but today something good will happen. And then I love verse 14. And the Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. Now I looked up hold your peace. And one of the meanings in Hebrew is to be deaf to voices mm. around you. Mm. And I think when we apply that to our own lives, when the Lord is like, fear not, stand still, and don't listen to Satan. Don't listen to all of his minions saying, you're not good enough, you're dumb, you can't do this. Who's gonna fight for you? He's not gonna come today. I mean, just all those voices. And I think it's beautiful because then in verse 15, 
the Lord says unto Moses, wherefore criest thou unto me? I just think that makes me think of Jim with all these girls. <laughs> Why are you crying? Let's just solve the problem. Why are you crying? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. Hmm. Like, just take a step. I've got your back. I'm here with you. Don't listen to what everyone else is telling you. And you must, I mean, there had to have been so many voices Children of Israel. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it yeah. numbered that there were 600,000 just men, not including kids or, or women. So there's over like a million people screaming all sorts of stuff. And Moses is like, listen, and it's kind of like our version of chill out, <laughs> <laughs> chill right? <everybody. laughs> Fear not, stand still, don't listen to the voices, just take a step forward. And at that moment is when Moses parts the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. And then it says they went through on dry ground, which I think is so awesome because I have missed that portion of that scripture for so many years. I mean, not only did he do the miracle, but I love God because then the Lord and God basically won up the miracle by making the dry ground. Yeah. Didn't even have muddy feet. Oh, awesome. I mean, it should have been muddy and stinky and fishy, but dry ground and then they just take off. Yeah. It's the coolest. Like that is what Hebrew does for scriptures. Yeah, it's not so fun. Yeah, great, great, great insights. And then we apply it to our own lives because every one of us, I think today in the world we live in, our amygdala is in yeah, it's, oh, it's, 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 it is it's in high demand. Yeah. It is constantly moving. Just uh, we are in a fight or flight mode almost every day. But I think when we put our trust in the Lord and go to Him, He says, "I'll fight your battles. I'll show you the salvation of the Lord. Just stand still, be calm. Don't listen. I'm going to do this for you." Mm -hmm. Tammy, it has been so much fun to have you here. I want to remind everybody, it's Sunday on Monday podcast. Yeah. Obviously, just by the name, Sunday on Monday podcast. Sunday on Monday. You can get that through Desert Bookshelf Plus. Okay, check that out, and it's out there available. Lots of fun. You always Thanks. have fun people on to talk with, and insights, plus uh, with the Hebrew background, it always makes it interesting, and and the book as well. So, you know, check that out when it's back in stock. So yeah. hopefully it will be by the time this airs. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tammy, thank you so much for taking the Thank time. You, so Ryan. much fun to have you. Oh, this was awesome. What a great program. So thanks. Oh, thanks, Debbie.